Hey everyone, I am Shaz Jones, the host of the Bible Hacks podcast, and I'm joined today by my guest, Eric Johansson. Welcome, Eric. Hey, thanks for having me, Shaz. Thank you for being here. Now, I'd like you to kind of introduce yourself, just let people know uh, what you're all about, what you do. Absolutely. So, yeah, again, my name is Eric Johansson, and I am... A health coach, but with a very specific twist, I call myself spirit, soul, and body coaching. And I, I have this worldview that God made us in his image. And so we have a spirit, soul, and a body. And I focus a lot on mindset, but I believe that, um, you know, if you're not, if you're not like nurturing all three of the areas in which we're made, the, the analogy I often use is, is like a tripod. And if you remove one of the legs from a tripod, it can still stand, but now it becomes a balancing act. And you hear a lot of people in life talking about how they're trying to balance, always mm -hmm. trying to find balance. Yeah. And I kind of feel like I'm not. <laughs> like <laughs> I have I have this tripod that's that is balancing me I don't have to work so hard at maintaining my balance because I'm always nurturing my spirit my soul and my body okay and so that's that's how I stay in balance and so my my real focus is on men but I'm not excluding women but I'm just I think my messaging is more toward men um for the sole purpose that I think a lot of men are denying their spiritual side or they're underserving their spiritual side. Maybe they're maybe they're reluctant to talk about it um, for whatever reason. So I want to try to give men a voice to express that spiritual side, as well as you know we know statistically, and if you talk to you know really any doctor, they'll tell you that men tend to not come into a doctor or not take care of their health. Mm. I mean, I'm all about natural, but they, men tend to not take care of their health until you know, it's kind of too late sometimes mm. or things have gotten to the point where now it requires surgery or some real radical intervention to correct things. And I'm more about the natural approach and learning to listen to your body so that you can, you know, prevent things from getting out of hand. Okay. And that's really interesting because I don't think I know of anyone else who is specifically stating they're a coach for spirit, soul, and body. So I know a lot of coaches that are faith-based or, you know, a specific faith or something like that. But I haven't heard anyone just say I'm interested in that, that tripod approach of all three. So how did you come to, to that conclusion that that was the best way to coach people? Yeah, that's a good question. So I have been a Bible reader since I was a kid. Right. So I was probably one of these unusual kids. It was, um, I was like either 10 or 11, late 10 or early 11 year old. And my mom gave me a Bible. And I was just dumb enough to think like you treat it like any other book. So I started at the beginning and I read to the end. And I've pretty much never stopped my entire life. I've read the Bible about 25 times now. I'm kind of stopping counting because at this point it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I've, you know, when I read, had read the Bible like five times, people were amazed at that. And if, you know, if I ever get to like 50, you know, people are going to be amazed at that. So the point is most people aren't reading their Bible front to back. So because of all this Bible reading and studying, um, you know, I've been keenly aware of the fact that we have, this nature, you know, the, the way that God made us. And, you know, I, again, going back to that analogy, I just love that tripod analogy because people can picture it in their mind and very quickly understand that, yeah, if you're, if you're not taking care of those three areas of your life, you're, you're going to struggle with balance. So, you know, my coaching program has specific ways to help people kind of wherever they're at. You know, some people might come into my program mm -hmm. where, their health is the biggest challenge. And so my program can, you know, kind of mold to that. If they, um, 
you know, if they're struggling spiritually and just kind of maybe aren't sure who they are spiritually or that kind of thing, we can focus on that and then, you know, eventually fill out all other areas. So I want to, you know, I want to definitely keep it adaptable like that. But okay. the Bible says one time it uses the phrase that the actual, the actual phrase is spirit and soul and body. And so I condensed it down just a little bit, you know, I guess maybe for marketing purposes or whatever, but it puts it in that order. And I think it's in that order because, um, you know, the spirit, our spirit is God's, no matter what happens when we die, wherever we go eternally, God owns our spirit, but the soul, what happens to our soul has something to do with our decision in this time, you know, in this life. And then, of course, our body, we have all kinds of free will over. We, we can mistreat it or we can treat it really good or whatever. So I, I think it's in that order for a reason. And so I just kind of wanted to respect that order. Okay. Yeah, so that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm usually interested in sequence of things because it, it really does affect the outcomes, I think, if you, right. if you do the right sequence. So when you say that, the Bible says spirit, soul, and body. Um, is there s some way that you manifest that in your programs? You mentioned if someone comes in like with a physical um, issue, then you'll address that first. Do you still try and get spiritual things in there, even if it says physical um, issue? Or do you to yeah. look after what the pressing issue is and then later start with a spiritual foundation? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I think the quick answer is that my my program is really about integrating all three kind of all at the same time. Okay. But what I what I meant earlier was that if if there's a you know, it's kind of like when you're in debt and you say and you decide one day, I'm gonna get out of debt. You know, most debt counselors or advisors will tell you, you know, take well, there's actually a couple of schools of thought, but it's but most of them will tell you work on the biggest one and you know and and work on that and get rid of it, you know, and then take the money you were spending on that and and work on the next biggest one and just start lopping them off like that. So in that same kind of thought pattern, you know, whatever is the biggest concern for somebody, I kind of want to bring that under control so that their their focus can be more broad because i think when you're having a you know to use a health issue you know if you're having some kind of a health issue it, it can become your focus you know 24 mm. 7 mm. and it's hard to think like oh i'm going to you know quiet my mind and read the bible <laughs> you know when when you're having some kind of constant you know it could be pain it could be constipation it could be a whole you know there's it's endless right yeah. But if but if that's the thing that's distracting you the most, that's the thing I kind of want to get under control first. Right. And then and then start, you know, spreading out to the other areas. Yeah, I think particularly if it's pain, people want that addressed. And you're right, then they're free right. to concentrate on other issues. Well, it's um, it's the rock and the shoe kind of thing, right? Yeah. You have a rock in your shoe it's like nothing else matters until you get that rock out of your shoe <laughs> so yeah, and then you can make progress yeah. so i wanted to ask you you mentioned that you've been reading your bible since you're about 10 or 11 um, yeah. and i got given a bible when i was 11 too so yeah. and i treasured it um you still so have it have you got a favorite Bible verse or um, a favorite Bible writer or favorite Bible theme? I do. So uh, I would say Paul is absolutely my favorite okay. author. And it's actually one of his verses that is my favorite because I think it's the key that unlocks the Bible. Wow. So it's it's Second Timothy 2.15. And it says, study to show thyself approved a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that last statement is really the key because everybody acknowledges that there's at least two divisions in the Bible, you know, the old and the new. Mm -hmm. And depending on what your specific, you know, religion or 
beliefs are or whatever, you know, you either believe you're under the law or you you believe that you're not under the law. So like that in, in and of itself is a division of sorts. Um, you know, Paul equates the law to a schoolmaster. And he says that when, you know, that the schoolmaster is there to bring us to Christ, but after we're in Christ, then we no longer have a need for a schoolmaster. So, so that rightly dividing issue is, is really important because if, if a person's not really honest or they're maybe not um, as affluent in the Bible or educated, you can, you can really make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. You know, you can pull verses out of context and combine verses that weren't really meant to be combined and, you know, come up with your own religion for all that is concerned. And, and so that's, that's why I think there's a lot of religious confusion out there. And I think that it also leads to a lot of like spiritual insecurity. People don't really know who they are. They don't really know who God is. They're not reading his words. But yet they say they believe the Bible. Lots of people say they believe it, but they've never read it. So with that in mind, I'm actually um, doing a challenge. It's kind of, hopefully I didn't bite off more than I can chew, but I'm going to stick with this. So it's an annual, you know, it's a challenge to read the Bible, you know, over the course of 2023. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. So I really liked um, one particular phrase there because I haven't heard it before, spiritual insecurity. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Or Yeah. yeah. So I use that phrase to describe somebody that is, so I'm, I'm a, you know, I, I typically identify as a Bible believer first. Then I'll say I'm a Christian, but Christian gets very overused. So I'm a little slow to just throw it out there first. Um, so there are a lot of people that claim to be Christian, but then they, you know, they say they're, they'll use terms like I'm saved or, you know, I asked Jesus into my heart or, you know, kind of whatever verbiage they had when, you know, or have with their religious experience. But if you challenge them and say, how do you know, or where in the Bible does it say what you believe or what you're saying, you know, where in the Bible, most, most, most people can't, you know, take you to the Bible and tell you why they believe what they believe. And I think that that leads to a lot of spiritual insecurity. Okay. So if we're thinking about in business because a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs have their own business or their leaders or speakers in sure. some way how would that manifest how would you know if someone had spiritual insecurity so for me the only way i would necessarily know for sure is through conversation and i often I just have this way of kind of driving people into deeper conversations. You know, I can kind of turn anything to the spiritual and I like doing that. I like going there. I'm not much of a small talker. Um, <clears throat> and so through the course of conversation, I often get into conversations with people where they'll, they'll say, they'll start using language where they, they kind of feel like they're not sure if they're saved. And, you know, again, there's a lot of different religions out there. There's a lot of different beliefs about this. I'm not necessarily trying to start a debate about that, but I believe that when you become a child of God, there's God's never going to take it back. You know, even even in real life, or not in real life, but like in in our in our earthly life, if okay, so I have a I have a 12 year old daughter. One day she could absolutely reject me and say she wants nothing to do with me, right? But she's still my daughter. You know, I could do the same thing. I could ostracize her and tell her I don't want her in my life or whatever, but she's still my daughter. So in that same way, when, again, it's all dependent on actually becoming a child of God. Again, a lot of confusion out there or things I don't agree with. A lot of people say that we're all children of God. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't say that. But if assuming somebody thinks that you actually become a child of God, well, once that happens, 
if you're not if you're not sure that you you maintain that status or you can lose it that that leads to a lot of insecurity because then you think well do i have to keep the law or do i have to ask for forgiveness or do i have to repent of my sins like what does it mean to keep something and then and then think about it for a second if if i wasn't good enough to earn my salvation in the first place how am i ever going to be good enough to keep it and and that leads to almost um like a psychosis of sorts where you where it's you know because you know you know you weren't good enough to get it in the first place and 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 so logically you know there's no way you can be good enough to keep it and so that that's a scary situation to be in spiritually mm. speaking and so I, I think this is definitely scary <laughs> yeah so again if we're looking at the tripod analogy and your 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 spiritual leg is unstable or uncertain that that's going to leave you off balance okay so i i noticed on um your facebook page i think it was that you had revived the spirit i think feed the soul and nourish the body is that that's the correct. correct language yeah so if we wanted to revive the spirit of someone listening today where would we start? What does that look like? How do we do that? So I think the best thing that a person could do is document what they believe spiritually, like, like actually write it down. Okay. Um, especially if there's things a person says over and over again, like, oh, I'm a Christian. Okay, great. What does that actually mean? Like where, what does that mean to you? Where is that in the Bible? Like, how did you become a Christian? Like document. And so I have, you know, part of my program is helping, you know, providing some structure for people to actually do that. And then that way, if there are areas that you just don't know, or you're confused about, or just anything you're insecure about, that would be a great area to start studying and learn. And then, you, and then you just become less, you know, insecure about that. And, and I think that Consequently, that starts to revive your spirit, strengthens your spirit. Okay. Also, words on paper can change behavior. Um, I think Joe Polish says something like that, but it's very powerful when you see something written down or you are actually writing it down by your own hand, I think. Yeah. So that's interesting that you get them to do that as part of your program. What, when we think about feeding the soul then, is there yeah. something that um, you would encourage people to do, particularly if they're business owners? Does, does the soul have an impact on business, do you think? I think so. Um, when you think about some of the most successful business owners, they have, they have a passion that comes mm -hmm. through. You know, people even say the phrase, you know, put your heart and soul into it. Mm. What does that really mean? Right? Like, so the heart is, a, you know, it's a euphemistic way of talking about the mind. So we're, we're literally, and, and then like, what is the spirit? Well, you know, again, you could have 10 people in a room and you might get, you know, seven or eight different definitions of, of what the soul is. But the soul is, in my opinion, it's it's that thing that makes us us, right? When when somebody gets in a car accident and the news is covering it and and the and, and they've died, right? They refer to the body. That that's an acknowledgement that whatever made up that person is now gone, even though they're all there, but they're gone, right? So I think that's the soul. So when we talk about putting your heart and soul into something, um you know, it just means that 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 passion, that that essence that makes you, you you, you know, putting that into your business, into your business, I think makes all the difference in the world. Mm. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I'm, I'm just thinking about when Jesus was saying um, what the the two greatest commandments are, and you know, he said to love God and gave one standard for that, which is with all your heart right. and all your mind and all your soul. Um, That's a good point. 
But then the second one he said was love your neighbor as you love yourself. Right. So there's a self which we can actually, in a, a kind of dichotomy, say, well, there's you and then there's self. And you can observe self separate to you. Um, that's so that's you a good point. Can, you know, say, oh, as yourself, <laughs> yeah. um, like, say, oh, there's an anxious self or there's a peaceful self. But you is bigger than that and you can observe yeah. that. So there is a difference between that. And I think it helps a lot of people to say, okay, this the self that's manifesting at the moment is not necessarily me. I can choose between the anxious self or the peaceful self. So is yeah. that similar to your understanding? No, I, again, this this is like what we were talking about before we started recording. I, I think your observations are are so on point, and and I think I think that's act, act exactly it. And I think that writing it down helps to reconcile self and your soul. You know, mm-hmm. to to actually document those things, and then if there's something you're confused about or don't like or want to change or whatever it it, having it on paper makes it much more likely than just you know kind of swirling around in your mind Mm. yeah i think that serves um, to reconcile when they says you know write the vision down which a lot of business owners love that kind of bit they say that he who uh reads it may run with a vision so you're turning readers into runners when you write something down yeah well you can if you write it down well Um, so it it energizes people and can can change even the identity and certainly the activity of the reader if you do it well right so does your program you mentioned before a structure in your program is there mm-hmm. a structure that you give people to write things or do you just say document it and let them kind of free form no yeah that's there, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that with the right person but most people when they're looking at a blank journal or a piece of paper you know they, they might have one good thing to write down and then you know because most people are not writers today you know, everybody's like short form texting and little brief emails, but, you know, like documenting deep thoughts and deep ideas is just not something we do for the most part as, as a culture. So I, I provide some really um, deep open-ended questions that have kind of a progressive nature to them to help, you know, to help kind of blow all that up and get it, get it out of the head get it on the paper and then start asking questions around those questions, such as why and who and how and okay. you know when and all these kind of questions. And, and that, that's what helps people yeah. you know, go from just a blank piece of paper and not being sure what to write to going, Oh, okay, well, I can answer that question. Yeah. You know? that sounds and, then it, and then it becomes like, and, and what else? Right. I don't know if you've ever heard the awe question, right. And what else? So you can start expanding on the idea of whatever it is they wrote down. And so now journaling actually becomes something that a person can look forward to because they know they don't have to like come up with what they're going to write, or it doesn't allow the journal, the journaling exercise to become like a diary, you know, like, well, today I did this and today I did that. It's like, who cares, you know, (laughs) and, and it, and it kind of forces people into a deeper state of thinking and, and processing very quickly. That's good. And I like that you use language to blow it up because yeah. <laughs> um, when, when Paul talks about things like arguments and thoughts and uh, knowledge in 2 Corinthians 10, he calls that weapons. So he says the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal. But right. then he goes on to describe using those things. 
um, and the way that they're related to Christ. Um, so I think that blowing things up is actually a really good military kind of term um, to describe that that mental area where we do need to, you know, and a lot of people in the world weaponize those things. Um, I, w- I wonder if you, in your, in your structure, like specifically talk about them in that way, or is it just the, I like that three word hack as well, and what else, or questions, that's really good. Yeah. Is it that that draws those things out? You know, I, I think so. I mean, I tend to, I tend to just talk like this anyway. And, and, you know, you, you brought up a good point as far as weaponizing things, people weaponize words against themselves. Just, just, just the way people talk to themselves. Um, and I, and I think journaling and documenting certain things helps to get that out on paper so people can see it for what it is. But, you know, Paul talks about being a good soldier for mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. He, he says it in the context of not getting caught up in the affairs of this life mm. or this world, you know? And, and I think, I think there's a lot of men, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I, I might just be free forming here, but I think there's a lot of men that, that lack a purpose. They, they lack that, that fight. They, you know, the, 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 the vision or the greater purpose, something, something that's worth dying for right i mean think about the you know what we call the greatest generation when when so many of our men went off to war at a very young age and and they made this country proud Mm. or whatever it was but they and they did it willingly right because they they had so many of them had that natural like this is a fight worth fighting for and and i think when men go go for too long with nothing to fight for, nothing that's worth dying for. You know, you, you asked earlier, they were, maybe we're coming back to your question the long way about um, feeding the soul. I, I think for a man, there's no better way to, to feed your soul than to have something that is of such value that it's worth dying for. Something you're fighting for that's of, of enough value that it's worth dying for. Wow. That's really profound. And again, I haven't heard that uh, connection between fight and purpose before. So that's really interesting. Do you have any I mean, background in the military or in like martial arts or any kind of? I, I, I really don't. Now, I was I was in law enforcement for a, about a year, a little over a year. Okay. But. I got into law enforcement when I was 32 and I'm currently 56. So even prior to me becoming a cop, people would often, like when I was in my twenties, people thought I was a cop because I just carried, I just carried myself that way. Yeah. So, but no, no, you know, in fact, I tried to avoid military service when I was a kid, (laughs) Okay. you know, I I think it's in you. It's, it's part of yeah. your design, I think. So it's interesting that you notice other people feeding that back to you. Look, we're running out of time. I hate this, but <laughs> how can people good. find you, Eric? What's the best way to connect with you? Yeah, best way to find me is just go to my website. It's a, like a directory website. You can find all my contacts and socials and all that. So it's just Eric T. Johansson, my full name. So it's Eric, E-R-I-C, T is in Tom. And last name is Johansson, J-O-H-A-N-S-E-N.com. So Eric T. Johansson.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining me today, Eric. Yeah. I've really enjoyed yeah. our conversation. And I urge thank you people so much. to catch up with you. Um, and also, if you got value out of today's conversation with Eric, please leave a comment or give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this podcast and tell us what you loved about it and what we can do to help you um, in your Bible hacking for your business.